Good evening. Welcome to NASA's Vartan Gregorian Building. My name is Silva Sedraikian, and I'm the Executive Director at NASA. Tonight's program is the fourth and final event in a series titled Exploring Hybrid Identities of Armenian Americans in Massachusetts, which is supported by a grant from Mass Humanities under their Expand Massachusetts Stories initiative. The first three were only in-person workshops, while this one is an illustrated lecture. We are grateful to Mass Humanities for their support of this series. For the in-person participants tonight in this hall and all in tonight, we are providing you a copy of the book titled The Armenians of New England. This one. Oops. Enjoy the reading. And for all of you, um, we are currently having a spring sale at NASA's bookstore, and this book is actually on sale, 50%. We encourage you to send us your feedback um, on this program and indeed on any other programs at NASA. Please email us at hq.nasa.org with your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so now we have many programs scheduled for this coming mix, weeks and months, and both in person, hybrid, and online. And we encourage you to get on our email list, email distribution list, and to follow NASA on the social media. Over more than six decades, NASA has provided hundreds of public programs, conferences, seminars, and panel discussions connecting prominent scholars to our community all free of charge, or your generous and continued support will help carry NASA's mission in advancing Armenian studies. If you are not a member, please consider becoming a member and join our NASA family. The membership cards are available in this room, actually at the entrance of this room, and for those online, you can contact us for information on membership or follow the link on our website. Now, before I introduce you to our speaker tonight, and I'm sure you're impatiently waiting to hear from him, I would like to introduce you to our new staff member, Paige Anderson, who has joined us a few weeks ago. Paige is a graduate of Wellesley, and she brings to us her cheer, laugh, and skills. Why don't you come and say hello? Hello, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me. So now let me introduce you to our speaker tonight. Mark Mamigonian is the Director of Academic Affairs at NASA, uh, where he has worked since 1998. He's the co-author of the volume Annotations to James Joyce's Ulysses, Oxford University Press 2022, with John Turner and Sam Slot. Actually, Slot, sorry. And, and he is the editor of the volume, The Armenians of New England, this book, 2004. And he's a co-editor with Mary Jane Rain and Thomas Cohen, which I'm mispronouncing, I'm sure, I'm so sorry, of Documenting the Armenian Genocide, Essays in Honor of Tanur 2024. Thank you and enjoy the program. That's okay now. And good. Thank you, Silva. Thank you. Uh, thank you to NASA for making space in its busy schedule for my talk. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, very nice gesture. Uh, for those of you um, who are in the room tonight, by the way, after the talk, if you have questions, we invite you please to come up to, to the microphone and ask them into the microphone. 
um, so that we can hear you and those online can hear you. And for those of you on Zoom, as always, you can use the Zoom Q&A, and I will try to pick them up off of my phone uh, and answer as many as possible. So uh, I would like to begin with a digression, if you can do that. Uh, an earlier version of this talk was given a few months ago at a workshop at Brandeis University in December, uh, organized by Professor Amy Singer. The workshop was called Ottoman Diasporas in New England, and it was an excellent event with very high quality presentations and discussions. The title of that workshop prompted or required me to, to think about the concept of Ottoman diasporas. I uh, entirely endorsed the, the gesture to move beyond viewing the various ethnic groups who lived in the Ottoman Empire, whether Armenians, Greeks, Syrians, Jews, Turks, etc., in separate boxes as if they existed in isolation from each other in the old country any more than they did here in Massachusetts or, or elsewhere in the, in the New World uh, to which they emigrated. Nevertheless, I felt it was important to bear in mind that in the 19th century, as the Armenian, Armenian immigration to the United States was beginning, uh, in the period generally known as the era of Tanzimat under Sultans Abdul Majid and Abdul Aziz. Uh, Tanzimat encompassing a series of reforms, reorganizations, and efforts aiming at the more modernization of the Ottoman Empire and the centralization of the state, a period that, as Talin Sujian writes in her excellent recent book, Outcasting Armenians, Tanzimat of the Provinces, quote, while centralization of the state seemingly made the Ottoman administration more accessible to the Armenian st struggle, st struggle for the security of life and property, Tanzimat should be regarded first and foremost as a process of implementing new territorial and temporal governance methods in which the security of life, property, and honor was constantly contested. It's no wonder then that during this time of apparent reform, gradually more and more Armenians looked to exit the empire. Later, after Abdul Hamid became sultan, Ottoman Armenians were specifically subjected to prohibitions intended to block their migration to America, and subsequently, they were disallowed from legally returning to their homeland. Ottoman Armenians were photographed to prevent their return, uh, what uh, scholar Zainab Gersel in her valuable work calls portraits of unbelonging. Finally, Ottoman Armenians were subjected to Ottoman state-directed violence, in the 1890s, in 1909, and uh, finally again in and after 1915 with the final destruction of the Armenian community along with the Greek and Assyrian communities during the Armenian Genocide. Simon Payaslian has written that, quote, beginning with the immigrants in the 1890s, each succeeding generation added a new layer of imagination of Armenia as determined by the political realities on the ground, both in the homeland and in the host society. While I'm rolling back the date a little bit to 1870 for the purposes of this talk, uh, these were some of the political realities on the ground for Armenians, and the formation of the Armenian diasporan community in Massachusetts occurred in that context. Of course, there were realities on the ground here in Massachusetts also. For the sake of convenience and simplicity, let me quote from the very useful Boston College digital project, Global Boston. During the 19th and early 20th century, uh, Boston's industrial economy matured and expanded across the region. New manufacturing plants were built along the city's main railroad lines, and new subway and streetcar lines fueled the building of homes and factories in adjoining suburbs. The city of Boston itself continued to grow, more than doubling its population between 1880 and 1920. That is from 362,000 to 750,000 in the city proper. The increase was even more significant in the metro area. Immigrants made up nearly 40% of those residents in the 1910s, the city's peak immigration decade. With so many countries sending immigrants abroad, Boston's foreign-born population gradually shifted. Although the Irish continued to be the city's largest foreign-born group, Canadians, Russian Jews, and Italians all formed large communities by the early 20th century. Smaller streams of migrants also came from China, Portugal, Poland, Lithuania, the Ottoman Empire, and the West Indies. Uh, in the understudied area of Armenian American history, the decades prior to the 1890s are especially murky as a tiny number of Armenians began to form the basis for what would become a more substantial 
and established community after the mid-1890s, although the post-1890s decades are hardly well documented either. Among the relatively few substantial works that focus on the early community are these displayed here. The terminal date of 1924 for tonight's talk was chosen because that's the year of the Johnson-Reed Act, which set a total quota on immigration at 165,000, almost an 80% reduction of pre-World War I numbers. That's 165,000 people total, not Ar Armenians, obviously. And set caps on the number of immigrants from any particular nation on the percentage of each nationality recorded in the 1890 census, meaning that the number of Armenians who could legally immigrate uh, in 1925 was 124, which isn't very many. Um, for, the purpose, for, for the period under discussion today, special mention must be made of Robert Myrak's pioneering and essential work, still 40 years after it was published, Torn Between Two Lands. For those seeking an in-depth history of the early Armenian-American community, Myrak's book remains the starting place. Uh, similar praises owed to Martin Duranian's more narrowly focused Worcester is America, and Benjamin Alexander's recently published uh, Ararat in America at the lower right corner there is a long-awaited carrying forward of the Armenian-American narrative further into the 20th century. There are also valuable online projects such as the Armenians of Whitensville, and one hopes others will follow their model. Other important work uh, and publications can be seen here, and it's not exhaustive, but on the other hand, it's also not that large a body of, of work still. My own modest work in this area began in 1999, my second year at Nasser, when I was part of the organizing committee for the conference, the Armenians of New England, to which I contributed a chapter on the Ararat Grocery of Boston, uh, about which more anon. And later, I edited the book of the same title. I'll be drawing in part on my research on the Ararat Grocery tonight, though in many ways I would like to go back and rewrite that chapter because I figure I'm smarter now than I was then. Um, although not as smart, hopefully, as I will be in another 25 years, I don't know. Uh, but really, uh, it goes back further to my efforts to learn more about my own Armenian-American family history. I didn't think of it in this light when I was pestering my parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles for information, um, who was in this photograph, when did so-and-so get married, etc. But you've got to start somewhere. So tonight I will be combining some of that history history with family history. Because with formal scholarship still in short supply, important contributions are being made by individuals who are engaged in their own genealogical research. Since history, Armenian-American history being no exception, is not just a recitation of, of organizations and entities and, and dates, but is also made up of the stories of individuals, the value of this history uh, is not to be underestimated. And the collective efforts of those who have organized and spoken at the several Armenian genealogy conferences in recent years and who daily answer questions and ferret out information on the Armenian Genealogy Facebook group, literally the only thing I use Facebook for, are impressive and deserve recognition. Likewise, the incredible work of Mark Arslan and his online Armenian immigration project. The history of your grandparents or great-grandparents or mine is inseparable from the history of this community of which they were a part and vice versa. So what I'd like to do tonight is to attempt far from a comprehensive history of the early Armenian American community of Massachusetts and its myriad individuals and institutions. Rather, I am aiming at something more modest in scope, and that is to combine some family history with the early history of the community in Massachusetts or vice versa, and take a look at a perhaps idiosyncratically chosen selection of individuals and institutions. First, uh, a little bit of prehistory, that is before the somewhat randomly chosen year of 1870 that features in the title of this talk. The Armenian presence in America dates to around 1619 when one Martin the Armenian came to colonial Virginia. We have to say this. You have to mention this in every talk on Armenian American history. A few others would follow over the next two centuries, but however interesting these fleeting appearances are, 
Armenian American history per se only really begins in the 1830s, following the start of contacts between Armenians and American mis missionaries in the Ottoman Empire. Thereafter, a trickle of Armenians to America begins, with some achieving notable success. By the 1880s, the trickle has become maybe a stream of immigrants, mostly from the Kharpet region, but also from other places like Bitlis and Marzavan, to points on America's eastern seaboard and western coast. Worcester, Mass., where the first known Armenian arrived in 1867, and Fresno, California, 1881. Let me briefly touch on a few interesting figures from this early period. Khachador Christopher Oskanyan, Joseph Yaziji, Armanak Melkonian, and Hagop, Hagop Bogigian. Oskanyan is sometimes called the first known Armenian American, having emigrated to New York in 1834. He's a fascinating figure who could be and has been the subject of a whole lecture, but that lecture has been given by Nora Lesserson, whose recent University College London doctoral dissertation focuses on Oskanyan's life and work. You should watch her talk on Nasser's YouTube channel, and we eagerly await her book. Oskanyan doesn't really have anything to do with Massachusetts, however, but like Martin the Armenian, you have to mention him. <laughs> Joseph Yaziji was a Smyrna-born merchant who came to Boston in 1832, thus even before Oskanyan came to New York. And in 1836, established Yaziji and Goddard Company at 36 Central Wharf in Boston, a highly successful transatlantic importer of items shipped from Smyrna and elsewhere in the Mediterranean, and who became the Ottoman consul in Boston in 1852. He was the second person to hold that title, which is of particular significance because at the time, Boston was the only American city with an Ottoman representative at all, indicative of the strong commercial ties between Boston and the Ottoman Empire. He was succeeded as consul by his son, Oscar, and following Oscar's death at sea in 1884 by Yo Joseph Yazigi Jr. But was Yazigi even an Armenian? The fact that I'm including him perhaps gives you an indication of what my thinking here is. It's rather more than I can get into in detail, but there has been an interesting discussion over the years whether Yazigi was Armenian or Greek. He was a Roman Catholic. And in various sources dating back to the 19th century, he's referred to as an Armenian, whereas others refer to him as Greek, which may reflect the fact that in the 1830s and 40s, etc., there was no comfortable way for him to be identified as Armenian, since Armenians were barely a presence in the U.S. An American missionary in the Ottoman Empire was still in its infancy. But it may also reflect the fact that he was both Armenian and Greek, which has been stated by his granddaughter. His grave in Mount Auburn Cemetery identifies him simply as born in Smyrna in Asia Minor. Former Turkish consul in Boston, Omer Budak, in an article published in 2020, comes to conclusions about Yazigi's probable mixed ancestry that are similar to my own findings and those of Steve Pinkerton, research docent at Mount Auburn Cemetery, when we looked into the matter with the Armenians of Mount Auburn Cemetery walking tours that were led by Pinkerton, Ruth Tomasian, and myself. How Yaziji thought of himself as Armenian, Greek, or as a Smyrniote, or something else. We have no clear way of knowing. He does not appear to have written anything about his own thoughts on his own identity. Uh, much may yet be discovered about what must have been a small number of Armenians who made their way to Boston in the pre-Civil War period. For example, in 2015, again, when the first Mon Armenians of Mount Auburn event was held, Stephen Pinkerton found that the earliest Armenian interment in the cemetery dated from 1855. Further research revealed the story of one Simon Antranikian, born in Constantinople, who arrived in Boston from Smyrna in 1853. Records suggest that he worked as a daguerreotypist and a waiter in Boston. He died about a year and a half after his arrival of inflammation of the lungs. He was interred in an unmarked grave. Finally, just last year, a marker was installed to recognize Antranikian, thanks to the efforts of a number of members of the community and the folks at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So he now has a marker. Sometimes a random encounter will lead to greater knowledge of this era. Such was the case with a photograph I found for sale on eBay in 2018, described by the seller as, quote, beautiful antique photo taken in the Sawyer Gallery of Philadelphia. This fully costumed Armenian family looks as though they just arrived onto, Armenian, uh, onto American shores. 
The pen and ink writing identifies them as A.J. Mel AJ Melkonian from Armenia. Armanac Johannes Melkonian, it would emerge, is well documented in various contemporary sources and a figure of considerable importance in the history of the Armenian community both on the East Coast and the West Coast in the U.S. As for the photograph itself, happily, it was purchased by our esteemed friend and NASA board member, Mark Momjen of Philadelphia, who I hope is watching. Melkonian is mentioned in only one source I consulted on the early Armenian American community, Berge Bulbulian's The Fresno Armenians, where it is stated that Dr. A.J. Melkonian was, quote, Fresno's first Armenian physician, which appears to be true. Bulbulian also notes that in an 1890s Fresno directory, Melkonian is also listed as pastor of the Armenian Baptist Church, holding services at the Armenian Library Hall, but he dismisses this, writing that this seems to be an error. However, it is not an error. A.J. Melkon Melkonian was both the first Armenian physician in Fresno and the first Armenian Baptist minister, not only in Fresno, but in the entire United States. According to an 1885 biography of Melkonian, he was born in Bitlis in 1843, and as a young man, he was converted to Christianity by an Ar American con congregational missionary. He came to the U.S. in 1876, specifically to Millbury, Mass., just south of Worcester, where he joined the Baptist Church. He returned to Bitlis and then came back to the U.S. to Philadelphia and attended Jefferson Medical College. Then he studied at Crozer Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania and was ordained as a minister. He was in Erzurum from 1884 to 1889 and then returned to the U.S. and relocated to Fresno where he lived out his days. According to Vartan Malcolm, in 1875 there were around 70 Armenians in America. According to the 1930s publication, The Armenians in Massachusetts, by 1880 there were 40 Armenians in Massachusetts, about half of them in Worcester and Millbury, and the remainder in metropolitan Boston. Why Millbury? I don't know. Melkonian died in Fresno in 1931 and is buried in Fresno's Ararat Armenian Cemetery. An obituary in the Bakersfield Californian in 1931 gives his age as 88 and notes that Melkonian, 42 years ago, came here to care for both the physical and spiritual troubles of members of the Armenian colony. He was both a physician and a pastor. He was active in both professions until about 20 years ago. More research can and should be done on Melkonian, one of the pioneers of the early community on both coasts. And he left his mark in the historical record, but his full significance and impact uh, remains to be discovered. Another one of those handfuls of Armenians in Massachusetts in the 1870s was Hagop Bogigian, born in Hysonig in 1854, who came to Boston in 1876, the same year Melkonian was in Millbury. Did they run into each other? I don't know. Bogigian was the so became the so-called first Armenian-American millionaire. He was an important figure who, who fortunately is well documented, especially thanks to the efforts of his nephew, our late friend, Dr. Martin Duranian, who wrote about him extensively. I'd now like to turn to the earliest member of my family, or at least the earliest direct ancestor, to immigrate to America, my great-grandfather, Giragos Sarkisian. Not because he was a central figure in the history of the community, like these other figures, however much he may be a central figure in my history, but because he was a part of the community from its infancy. Born in the Surp Hagop neighborhood of the upper city of Harpert around 1872, Giragos, the son of Sarkis and Anna Maliamezian, came to the U.S. in September 1888, arriving a scant few months after the Ottoman Empire had introduced a ban on Armenian migration to the U.S., settling in Massachusetts and changing his name to Sarkisian. When he arrived, there were probably no more than 1,500 Armenians in the United States. He was preceded by an older relative, Kevork Maliamezian Giragosian, who, based on the evidence of photographs, was in the U.S. earlier than my great-grandfather and who is seen here with him on the right. Meanwhile, life and death for his family continued back in Harpert. He left behind his parents and two younger brothers. A younger sister, Hanum, was born after his departure, and a second younger sister, Johar, would be born after his departure and die in childhood without his ever meeting her. In the late 1890s, he was joined in the United States, in Boston, by his brother, Hagop, who took the name uh, Sarkisian also and who is seen here on the right standing 
behind him. His sister Hanum would come later in 1913. His brother Hofsepp was arrested in Harpert in 1915, imprisoned, tortured, and murdered. His mother, Anna, emigrated to the U.S. in 1923 and died in Boston in 1928. I don't know when his father, Sarkis, died, although I, I hope it was before in 1915. This is a photo uh, that was shared with me by a cousin uh, showing the funeral or wake or what have you of my great, great grandfather. Uh, Hopsep Ajemian, who obviously, it's obvious who he is. And I think, uh, I think what you can see here also, if I can point, it's hard to tell. So that is Hopsep, my great-grandfather's brother, and he looks like he's holding a photograph probably of my great-grandfather. So this was in Harpert around 1905. By 1900, Giragos was living in Boston's South End and riding a bicycle uh, and managing a restaurant. In 1901, he ran for the Boston City Council. It distresses me to inform you that he lost. <laughs> but he ran, and I wonder why. In, in 1902, he had achieved sufficient recognition that his marriage to Mariam Tastian in Boston was written up in two of the city's daily papers. This is from the Boston Post. They had a family, as people will do. And in 1906, he established the Oriental Bulgur Company with his brother-in-law, Eliezer Jojorian, and his relative, already mentioned, Kevort Giragosian. One of the earliest advertisements I found for the Oriental Bulgur Company appeared in the Boston-based Armenian newspaper, Ask, in September 1907 proclaiming good news for Armenian Americans, it declares, and I thank Vartan Matiosian for giving the translation, fellow compatriots, our Oriental Bulgur Company, founded with a capital of $10,000, comes to give the good news that the Bulgur question has been de definitely solved for Armenian Americans. Our slogan is first class merchandise, moderate price, and fast, careful, and conscientious operation. To give an idea of the insuperable perfection of our bulgur, let us only say that in our newly opened factory, the vital task of preparing bulgur has been given to the person who first created bulgur in America, the originator of bulgur, Mr. Kevort Giragosian himself. The factory is endowed with the newest and most perfected machines. There is no need to, commend, to recommend the safety and trustworthiness of our operations if we say that the owners of this new enterprise are two Armenians known in American business, Mr. Eliezer Georgian and Mr. Giragos Sarkisian. The perfection of our bulgur surpasses even the taste and smell of the homeland's bulgur and has the pristine <laughs> beauty of the best oriental bulgurs. We have not spared any effort, any means, any expense, so our factory is the only one of its kind and our customers are fully satisfied with us and our bulgur. We deliver wholesale and retail bulgur to all corners of America. We give special care to orders. Try, and you will never abandon our road. People, this was quality bulgur. <laughs> Alas, the bulgur question might have been solved for Armenian Americans, but it was never quite solved for the rest of Americans. And it was not quite embraced by the Odar world in a way that would have made it possible for all of us to live off the fortune they earned. Uh, but nevertheless, business seems to have been not unprofitable. By 1910, the Oriental Bulgur Company became part of the Ararat Grocery Company, co-founded by Geragos, Nersis Tomasian, and Sarkis Atamian, and which combined their three businesses, each advertised here, into one. Atamian and Tomasian, like Giragos, were immigrants from the Carpet region. Atamian uh, had worked in the Worcester wire mills and in 1903 established a bulgur processing plant in Worcester, the Worcester Bulgur Company, which I'm sure had very high quality bulgur also. <laughs> and in 1898, Tomasian started the Massey's Grocery Company on Neyland Street in Boston. And uh, Tomasian, by the way, is the grandfather of our friend and colleague, uh, Ruth Tomasian, who's worked with Project SAVE, uh, which she started, has been an inspiration to me since I was in high school. 
in the early part of the 20th century, Greater Boston and Worcester and other population centers that had substantial Armenian uh, populations contained hundreds of small groceries or variety stores run by Armenians and other Middle Eastern immigrants. Robert Myrak estimates that around 1915, some 25% of employed Armenians in Boston ran shops or groceries of some kind. Well before the age of the supermarket, these stores were an important part of community, economic, and social life. But the Arat Grocery Company was not, o was not only, or even not primarily, uh, a local gathering place, being located as it was outside of the area where Armenian immigrant populations were con concentrated. Its headquarters was located at 150-152 uh, Commercial Street in Boston's North End, not far from Faneuil Hall, and even closer to what is today the Armenian Heritage Park on the Rose Kennedy Greenway, coincidentally. This building housed the Ararat's Boston Wholesale Grocery Center. There was another in wholesale center in Worcester. From these centers, orders would be shipped out to retail establishments via horse and wagon, or later trucks. Ararat's own retail stores were located on Neyland Street and North Street in Boston. Bulgur was one of their staple products, but they, and they had bulgur processing plants in Worcester and in Cambridge. Their clientele was not limited to Armenians, as th these ads would suggest, and it would seem, but it would seem that Armenians and other Middle Eastern groups formed the bulk of their customers. Nor was it limited to the greater Boston region. The Arat had customers and vendors all over the United States and indeed the world. As you can see, uh, this is the one, as far as I know, copy existing uh, of a catalog for the art grocery that was printed in 1914 by uh, Yaron uh, publisher in Boston, who you'll be hearing about in a few minutes. This is a picture of the Worcester Bulgur factory. In this building is our Worcester branch wholesale house, it reads. Here we have our Worcester factory as well, where we process our revered bulgur. And here also is our famous Bulgurji George who is Kevor Giragosian again, with his years of experience. He's the originator, after all, of Bulgar in the United States, as we now know. Look at how he is standing in the open elevator. He is the boss of the Bulgar factory. I hope they had fun with this stuff. This is a copy of a bill of sale from 1923, which perhaps, perhaps shows a typical purchase. Again, this comes from the collection of Mark Momjan. These are some of the items that you could purchase there from, well, you can see. They had something for everyone. <laughs> My great-grandfather died more than half a century before I was born. He left behind no writings or anything that would give me any insight into his thinking. But when I read the text of some of these advertisements for the Oriental Bulgur Company, etc., I find it interesting to ponder what, what is being communicated. One of them boasts that thanks to their, the, their superior bulgur, for the Armenians, quote, the demand is satisfied for our two national and ancestral dishes, kufta and pilaf. While another, as we've already seen, declares, I hope and I think, perhaps not without irony, that the bulgur question has been definitely solved for Armenian Americans. I have no indication of what my great-grandfather's politics were. His brother Hovsep was a hunchak, and apparently for this reason, he was among the first community leaders arrested in May 1915 in Harpert and killed. This very early 1890s photograph, shared with me by a member of the community, unaware that I had relatives in the photograph a few years ago, uh, his grandfather is one of the two pistol-packing men at the far left of the picture, seems to be or may be some kind of political or revolutionary group. The sign reads, Ungeragan Ser, comradely love, with the year 1892 and another illegible word. What were they up to? <laughs> the pistols suggest not necessarily anything good. <laughs> 20 years later, uh, Giragos was part of the leadership of the Boston chapter of the AGBU. He's at the, standing at the upper left. 
Does this signify a change in or a continuity of a particular worldview? I don't know. And unfortunately, there is no real way of knowing, can only guess. At any rate, he and his business partners were looking to turn a profit and to achieve success in American terms, while at the same time, I infer, trying to remain good Armenians, whatever precisely that meant to them. Payaslian, again, writes that, quote, for the early Armenian immigrants to the New World, the imperatives of Haya Papanum, preservation of Armenianness, or Aska Papanum, preservation of the nation, demanded the sacred struggle against Odoratsum, foreignization. I believe this is metaphorically being acted out here. No, <laughs> perhaps not. Undoubtedly, this, this was true for many. But in the ad, for example, uh, in the advertisements, I read not an effort not so much to struggle against Odar America, but rather to succeed in it by commercializing the striving for a preservation of Armenianness. That is, that is to say, to the extent that certain foodstuffs were part of the sense of identity of these early Armenian Americans, and, and I can only speculate the extent to which it was, but seems fair to assume that it was to, to some degree. The Arat Grocery seems to have been marketing an identity-based product mainly to an immigrant customer base. It worked to, ex to an extent. The business was successful. One account by uh, Miriam Kochakian, an Armenian who grew up in the small town of Madison, Maine in, in the 1930s, recalls that, quote, Madison Armenian families, two or three together, would order some of the staple ingredients necessary for their native dishes in bulk from an Armenian food importer in Boston, the Arat Grocery Company. A typical order would include bulgur, cracked wheat, red lentils, chickpeas, cracked barley, long grain rice, orzo, black olives, spices, and flavorings, according to the individual needs and tastes of the families. The large wooden shipping boxes from the importer were delivered to the freight office on Pine Street and then carted to one of the family homes where the goods were divided among the family purchasers. Tucked among the basic foods, much to the delight of the children, were some small packages of delicacies like Turkish paste, salted and candied chickpeas, halva, muscat raisins, and dried mulberries. These goodies were usually kept for holiday treats. So it's nice for me to think uh, of the Arat grocery in some way, contributing to these far-flung Armenians' uh, sense, sense of themselves as, as Armenians. But as I discuss in my chapter on the Arat and the Armenians of New England, in the long run, the business could not depend on the patronage of Armenians and others from the Near East, who tended to become more assimilated in their food preferences with the passing of the years and the generational turnover. And uh, the business did not survive long enough to reap the benefits of the ethnic revival of the 1970s and beyond when this kind of food became cool. The establishment of businesses from which Armenians in America could purchase old world foodstuffs was only one, and not necessarily, of course, the most important, even if it was the most delicious, example of the institutions that functioned as means of identity preservation, or identity affirmation, or identity construction in the early Armenian American community. More obviously, religious institutions were among the most important cornerstones of the community. The first Armenian apostolic church in America, in the hemisphere, was the Church of Our Savior consecrated in Worcester in 1891, while the Protestant Armenian Church of the Martyrs in Worcester is even older. The history of Armenian churches in America, happily, is well covered in various publications, and to prevent this from being a genuinely interminable presentation, I will not dwell on them too much further, which is to say that there is, which is not to say that there isn't a lot to be said about them and their contributions to the Armenian American community during this period. In fact, it's a huge subject that probably should be explored more beyond just narrating the, the histories of these churches, thinking about how they helped shape the community and how the community helped shape them. But that's a different topic for a different day and a different person. Instead, I will turn to secular undertakings, such as Armenian American newspapers, publishing houses, and libraries, which began their intellectual work at the same time that the churches were beginning their spiritual missions, but are not as well covered in, in, in sources. In the 1937 book, The Armenians in Massachusetts, uh, 
the Mekhitarist father M. Bodurian is quoted as saying, quote, whenever a few Armenians find themselves in a foreign land, their first thought is to publish a newspaper instead of opening a kindergarten. Of course, we know it's not one newspaper, but rather several newspapers. Uh, Haig Eginian earned the title the father of the Armenian American press by establishing the first Armenian newspaper, Aregag, Sunlight, in Jersey City in 1888. After Aregag's brief gleaming, he published a series of other newspapers in New York and New Jersey, then moved to Fresno and started other papers there. While still in the New York area, he also undertook the publication of a number of books, which I believe are the first Armenian books printed in America for consumption by other Armenians in America. But let us get back to Massachusetts. Other independent, that is to say unaffiliated with a political party, newspapers and periodicals such as Yeprad, Euphrates, a semi-weekly newspaper published in Worcester in 1897 and 1898, or Lewis Light, published in Cambridge in 1901 to 1907, came and went. Generally speaking, the most enduring and influential newspapers were those that became uh, political party organs. The history of Armenian American newspapers and book publishing and political parties are inseparable from one another, so a short digression is necessary here. The Armenian political parties or revolutionary groups began to develop in the 1880s in the wake of the failure to implement reforms in Western Armenia following the Russo-Turkish War of 1887 and 78. The Armenicans were, uh, were established in Van in 1885, far left. The Hunchaks were established in Geneva in 1887, and uh, Myrak writes that they had set up branches in New York, Providence, Worcester, Boston, Lowell, Lawrence, Lynn, Malden, and Nashua in the early 1890s. The High Heropokagan Dashnak Sutun, or Dashnak Party, or ARF, was established in Tiflis in 1890, held its first World Congress in 1892. The Hunchaks because of various crises, not the least of which being, was, was the massacres of 1895-1896 and the absence of any meaningful intervention by the great powers, split with the Vergazmial or reformed Hunchaks forming in Alexandria in 1898 and, and an attempt at reunification in 1902 only led to deeper divides, bloodshed, and undoubtedly an increase in the population of uh, the popularity of the ARF as well as the creation of the more moderate Armenian Constitutional Democratic Party, or Ramkavars, in 1908. With the establishment of bases in the U.S., party papers, of course, followed. Dashnag, the Dashnag Heidernik, the most durable of these, began in New York in 1899, before moving to Boston, where it has remained ever since. Yeri Dasart Hayastan, founded by Stepan Sapagulian, in 1903 as an organ of the Hunchak party was considerably more mobile, moving from New York to Boston to Providence to Chicago, back to New York, and so forth. Zain Hireniats started out in New York in 1899, moved to Worcester, then Boston, became the official organ of the reformed Hunchaks, and then moved with its editor, Surin Bartevian, to Constantinople in the optimistic aftermath of the 1908 Young Turk Revolution. This is a copy from after the move. The Ramgavar Ask began publishing in 1907 in Boston. Bahag was started in Providence in 1910, uh, also a paper of the reformed Hunchaks, and moved to Boston, where it appeared until 1921, when it merged with Ask, spawning the cleverly named Ask Bahag. In 1923, that merger was rechristened as Baikar. Uh, I show with some pleasure a photograph taken at my great grandfather Ardashes Parunagian's house in Lawrence, Mass, around 1911. Ardashes is the jacketless man on the far left, and my grandfather Aram is the boy standing on the left. In which, if you zoom in, it's clear that several men are holding up newspapers, including Bahag and Azadamard, which was an ARF-aligned paper published in Constantinople. It's interesting that they're standing next to each other. Uh, clearly, it was important for them to showcase their political loyalties in this manner and to 
used the newspapers essentially as a flag. The parties established uh, publishing houses in addition to newspapers. As publishers, one might say that the number one task was the dissemination of political material relating to the overall mission of the party. But Heidernik, Baikar, Ask, Bahag, Yeri Desart, Hayastan, and Zain Harinyat's presses published a wide variety of material beyond the strictly political, although it is also true that even the literary productions had a political angle. For instance, among the earliest novels translated into English and published in the U.S. were Antronike, Hunagan, Heropohutan, Herosuhin, Andronike, the heroine of the Greek Revolution, by Stephanos Theodoros Kasenos, published by Heidernik in 1905, and Lutzin Dag, Under the Yoke, by Ivan Vazov, published in Boston by Zain Harenyats in 1906. Undoubtedly, the translation of Andronike, a romance uh, of the Greek Revolution, uh, was intended to inspire the Armenian readership of the 20th century uh, with a parallel story. According to the book's English translator, uh, quote, no other book in so realistic manner describes the birth throes of modern Greece. No other portrays more vividly the political and moral medley and chaos of the East. Likewise, Bulgarian author Vazov's 1893 novel tells a story of resistance to the Ottoman Turks in Bulgaria. It would be fascinating to know how widely these novels were read and what the response was in the Armenian community. Naturally, explicitly, political works are also present in abundance, such as Sabakulian's 1916 Socialism Yev Heidernik, Socialism and Fatherland, published in Providence by Yuri Desart Hayastan, or the translation of the socialist John Spargo's Unger Varutian Eutuna, The Essence of Socialism, published by Heidernik. A great deal more work can and should be done on these presses and their output and how they shaped and were shaped by the political and intellectual movements of the day. From the brief treatment of political party presses, I'd like to move to an independent publisher, one of my particular favorite subjects. In a particular, particularly special place among them stands Yeran Press in Boston, the work of the seemingly indefatigable Edward Arakel Yeran. I could go on and on about Yeran, and indeed Ani Babayan and I have already done so in a Nasser Treasures of the Mardigian Library feature in two parts. Uh, so if this isn't enough for you, you can definitely go online and read all about it there. Yeran was born in Chemeshkazak in the Karpet region in 1875 as Yervan Arakel Ignatiosian. He emigrated to the U.S. in 1893 and settled in Boston. His brothers, sister, and parents all perished in the Armenian Genocide. He married Elizabeth Saryan and had two children. Uh, he died in 1958 and is buried in Belmont Cemetery, about a mile and a half from where I'm standing. We know nothing of his early years in America, but by the early 1900s, he was associated with the Hyrenik Publishing House in Boston, and he was the translator of Andronike, uh, which we've already mentioned. Around the same time, he produced Perhaps his most popular and enduring creation, the Nor Kurbani Bararan, Gam Kurbanit Ungera, uh, the, new pocket, the pocket di new pocket dictionary or pocket companion. I believe that every Armenian American Ameri owned a copy of this book. Every single one, just judging by the number of copies we have in our library. <laughs> we can date the first edition of this publication issued by the Hyrenic Press to 1906 when it was located at 27 Beach Street in Boston. The first edition is credited to Yeran and M.K. Sadoyan. They were both Arme there were both Armenian English and English Armenian versions, which were subsequently combined into one volume. After a couple of printings, the newly established Yeran Press took over as the publisher, and much later in the 50s, the Hyrenik would again become the publisher of this perennial favorite. The other perhaps best known of Yeran's publications is the massive Undarzak Bararan Ankliarene Hayaren, a comprehensive dictionary of English, Armenian, English to Armenian. Still essential, 100 years after its publication. Edited by Professor H. H. Chakmakjian, a professor of biochemistry at Tufts and the father of composer Alan Hovanes. Eventually, this dictionary was republished in Beirut uh, and is still regarded as one of the best dictionaries of Western Armenian. Over the course of about 25 years, Yeran published a wide array of books, including Chakmakjian's Batmutyun Hayots, History of the Armenians, 1917, 
a general history. Books for the new immigrant, such as Chuck Machian's America High Namagner, or Armeno American Letter Writer, and Badgerazart Zurutsa Drutun Hayeren Ankliaren, Armenian English Conversation Illustrated. Uh, the same book also appeared in, um, as Turkish English Conversation Illustrated and was written in Armeno Turkish, that is to say, uh, Turkish language using the Armenian alphabet accommodating the many Turkophone members of the community. Translations of literary works, such as uh, plays by Moliere uh, and the tales of Nasreddin Hoca, and health and medical works, among many, many others. In Armenian, America, uh, in Armenian English Conversation Illustrated, under the title Hayera, the Armenians, we find a remarkable sample of a uh, representative conversation. It's almost a prose poem, I think. <laughs> Are you an Armenian? Yes, sir, I am an Armenian. What do you think of the Armenian people? The Armenians are of dark complexion. They have black eyes and black hair. They belong to the Aryan race. The Armenians are a good people. They are thrifty and intelligent people. They are the first people to accept Christianity. For centuries, they have suffered martyrdom for Christianity and civilization. They are good law-abiding citizens. The Armenians are one of the oldest races on the face of the earth. Their history dates back to 2,000 years before Christ. They have survived all their contemporaries, such as Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians, etc. It's probably news to the Egyptians, but never mind. They are honest, well-meaning people. Of course, there are a few degenerated Armenians, but, but they are exceptions. I believe that the good qualities are not the monopoly of any race. Man is the direct product of his environment. The good and bad the honest and the dishonest, the moral and the immoral, could be found in all the countries of the globe. The rose has its bush, the wheat its chaff. The Armenians have been subjected to Mohammedan rule for five centuries, but we are glad that Turkey is a constitutional government now. We hope there will be no more massacres hereafter. The hat dialogue is pretty great too, but I won't read that. Um, it's a fascinating book because it's clear that Chakmakchian is times trying to get across certain messages uh, about Armenians and about, about the new community. Likewise, the America High Namagani, or Armenian American letter writer, is one of the most fascinating books Yaran or, or anybody published in this period. It contains a large variety of model letters adapted to all occasions, letters of friendship, letters of congratulation and condolence, letters on love, business letters, and perhaps the most striking and poignant examples given both in Armenian and in English are those expressing the current concerns of new immigrants, such as impressions of a newcomer, letter of a disappointed man, and from a father. Chuck Makchian's History of the Armenians is an ambitious work of popular history and is probably the first book of its kind produced in the US, the first history of Armenians written in the United States. In the book's foreword, written, we must bear in mind as news of the annihilation of the Armenians was reaching America, Chuck Makchian writes that, quote, we are facing an unprecedented catastrophe today. Blood is still flowing unhindered, honor is trampled on, laboring arms are crushed, Half-dead bodies are tortured for the sake of satisfying human evil, and loved ones are left hungry and naked in the face of death's hopelessness. But the responsibility to save the existence of the Armenians weighs on us that remain. In these circumstances, Armenian history is a requirement for national self-recognition and a necessity of individual education. A nation without history cannot have a place under the sun, and a nation with history must find a source of strength and wisdom in it. Having discussed who was publishing what and where and when, other questions arise, such as how did people get these books to read them? Here we enter into somewhat murkier territory. There were, however, a number of uh, Armenian bookstores and booksellers. There were also innumerable small Armenian libraries in many cities and towns where Armenians settled in any numbers. Exactly how many of either bookstores or libraries existed is not known. As far as I know, there has been no attempt to list them all. I mostly know of them from having encountered their book stamps in hundreds, possibly thousands, of books here in Nasser's library. And I'm not sure anyone before has really bothered to pay too much attention to them. But they're really interesting.
Anyway, a partial New England list would include Hyronic Bookstore in Boston, Ardziv Bookstore, Barbarian Bookstore, Armenia Bookstore, the Arox Bookstore in Chelsea, the Foreign Bookstore in Boston, the Baikar Bookstore, etc. And the libraries existed, as you see from the, saw from the stamps, in places that you wouldn't even suppose there were Armenians living. The limited information I have indicates that these were established in the 1890s and early 1900s, but for the most part, we don't know how long they lasted. Who created them? Who used them? How large were they? How long did they last? These and other questions remain unanswered. The era of World War I and its aftermath forever changed the relationship between diaspora Armenians and their homeland. And in Boston, as elsewhere, there were efforts to mobilize and aid those left in historic Armenia. One memorable occasion came on December 14, 1919 at the Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston for a gala event in honor of members of the Armenian mission uh, to the US, that is to say, the mission from the Republic of Armenia to the United States. This photo in Nasser's collection belonged to Manu Gyang, whose parents, Solomon Malyamezian Young and Aravni uh, Derkazarian Young, are visible in the photograph. Among the luminaries present at the head table are General Antonik, Armin Garo, and Alice Stone Blackwell. The banquet was part of an effort led by General Antonik to raise funds for a free and united Armenia among diasporan Armenians. He traveled the country raising money. And it raised more than $500,000 within a very short time by January 1920. A detailed report on this effort was published by uh, Yeran, of course, uh, in Boston in 1921 under the title Badvoy Girk, Book of Honor. And it lists each and every donor, community by community, regardless of how large or how small the contribution, often giving not just the amount of the donation, but which village or city the donor came from in the old country. And it's incredibly valuable source of information on several things. And it attests to what Armenians in America would do to try to save their nation. Uh, although I cannot find Giragos Sarkisian in the banquet photo, the Book of Honor records that he gave $1,000 to the campaign, which, as the saying goes, was a lot of money in those days. Today, New England, and specifically Eastern Massachusetts, is home to possibly the largest number of Armenian cultural and intellectual institutions outside of the Republic of Armenia. Among these is, of course, Nasser, and among, uh, which, among other things, is, and we would like it to be even more of, a repository of Armenian-American archives, publications, and to be a place where Armenian-American history can be studied and discussed. The foundations for this, and for the many other excellent institutions in this region, were laid well over a century ago by the, some of the men and women I've talked about tonight. But it's amazing that within 30 minutes of us right now, here in Belmont, are other important organizations dedicated to cultural production and preservation, including the Armenian Museum of America, Project Save Armenian Photograph Archives, the ARF Archives, the Armenian Cultural Foundation. For those seeking to understand the early Armenian diasporic community in America, Greater Boston is a key location. It's my hope to have provided some information, however idiosyncratic, about the first half century or so of Armenian American existence in Massachusetts, as seen through a few of its institutions and individuals and through the lens of one part of my own family. To conclude, I'd like to just pose a series of brief questions, starting with, who is going to write this history? Where and what are the necessary materials to write the history? How can we understand the early Armenian community in the context of other immigrant communities in this region or other regions? What's needed is the time and the skills to seek out and find this information, which means poring over newspapers, archives, libraries, catalogs, yearbooks, etc. But what is also needed, perhaps more than anything else, is the recognition that this is history that is worth studying. So thank you for your time and for your attention.
Questions? There's a question online. While you're pondering that, I will ask. Where can I find out where the first Armenian Evangelical Church of Boston was established in Porter Square, Cambridge? I don't know the answer to that question, but I will try to find out the answer to that question. Uh, if anyone here in the room knows the answer to that question or thinks they might know. Are they asking where it was? Where, it, where in Porter Square? Okay. Email me, and I will pass the information along. Questions? Oh. Okay. Questions? Questions? Yes, Roger, you seem to have a question. If you do, please get up and use the microphone. No, other than have questions, I just wanted to get your help. Please get up and use the microphone. Thank you very much. I love this, this aspect of our history. Yeah. It's so much more you know, uh, uplifting than all this, what we went through with the genocide. But of course, they arrived here because of the genocide. Um, I, uh, I want to mention the Global Boston website, Boston College. There's a woman, Dr. Marilyn Johnson, who started that. She also put a book together called The New Bostonians. And the Armenians are in a chapter in that, as well as in Global Boston. Great. Um, the Oriental Bullard Company, uh, has anyone ever heard of the Armeno Bullard Company? Yes, they were a hated yeah. rival, I think. Yeah, it's now, <laughs> yeah, it's in um, Northborough, I believe, and it's, it's now the Armeno Coffee Company. Right. But yes. I went inside, and the vats, is that what they call them, the vats for the fine and the coarse and the, the bullet are still there down below. So that's... That's pretty cool. I think they're the people who had the very low quality. No, I'm, yeah. I, I'm sure it was absolutely wonderful Bulgar as well. Yes. Uh, on a personal note, growing up in Dorchester in Cardman Square, we had a market called Casper's Market, the Casparian family. And um, it was right across the street from our house. And you know, you could go there, you get your, your lamb cut up, sliced up just the way you like it. There were four brothers you know, who ran it. Steve Kirkshin is related to those, if you're familiar with Steve. And, um, and he, this was our, my neighborhood where I grew up, and we had this Armenian market right across the street, and four houses in a row, three of them were owned by Armenians, all three deckers, triple deckers, and um, great memories that you're bringing, helping me uh, remember, and forgive me, just, I want to mention about a book you have in here at NASA. Please. That you know the book, I love this book, Armenians of Massachusetts, or Armenians in Massachusetts, published around 1937. It was part of the uh, Federal Writers Project of the New Deal. Right. And um, it, it, it gives a quite an interesting overview of the Armenians, but what caught my attention was somewhere in the beginning or at the end, it discusses um, how if Armenians are such good Americans, they're, being, they're being, working so hard to be good Americans, they will eventually, in a way, I'm not quoting this, but discard their heritage and, and become part of the melting pot. But we didn't do that. We, you can do both, and hmm. we did. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, question from online, what is being done, what steps are being taken to digitize these kinds of collections or OCR the periodicals for easier research? Ah, it's a very good question. It's a very big undertaking. Uh, well, for example, uh, the National Library of Armenia has digitized a vast quantity of, of Armenian newspapers, uh, including uh, diasporan newspapers. Um, which are available online. Not so much with the OCR, uh, which is to say they are not fully searchable, or in some cases not at all searchable. Um, other larger digitization projects are going on. Nasser has done some smaller scale digitization projects. For example, we digitized how many, Ani? A hundred or so uh, of the uh, yearbooks uh, Tarek Girks, Tarek Suites publications uh, from the, mostly from the early 1900s, not necessarily from the United States, although some certainly were. Um, it's a big project, and the newspapers, the availability, I should say, of newspapers, um, particularly thanks to the National Li Library, uh, although the Hydernik also has undertaken its own uh, large-scale digitization project, making these 
available to people who aren't able to access them otherwise, or you know they're too brittle to to handle, has really opened up scholarship the scholarship for a lot of interesting research. Question from online. The online people are really putting you to shame, but that's okay. We're not judging. Uh, how do you account for this huge gap in Armenian studies? Why has the history of Armenian Americans been neglected in scholarship? It's an excellent question. It's one that I have asked often. Uh, and I don't really know the answer, except that I could speculate that in some cases, maybe it feels too recent. Uh, maybe it feels too close. You know, the, you don't always necessarily pay attention to the things that are right in, in front of you. Um, and it, it may be even that it's been, there's been more interest shown in it by, by scholars outside of the U.S., uh, maybe even from, from Armenia. I, I think of the, the enormous illustrated volume we, we showed the picture of at the beginning that Haik Damoyan from Armenia put together. From Armenia, he put together this vast volume of Armenian American ephemera and, and material. It has not been a big part of Armenian studies in this country, maybe because, again, it's too, too recent and, and modern history itself has not been uh, all that much uh, of, a, of a priority, except among some scholars. Um, I do know that for example, Professor Hovhannisian, the late Professor Hovhannisian, who was the first scholar of modern Armenian history in the U.S., himself certainly promoted the study of Armenian American history, but it's still in its baby stage, I, I would have to say. Um, but there is some good work being done, fortunately, and uh, I, I hope, you know, in a few years we won't talk about it as being neglected anymore. Oops, I lost, okay. Not a question, just I'm very grateful to be able to participate via Zoom since there are virtually no Armenians or Armenian organizations where I live. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's nice to hear, we appreciate that. Uh, yes, might want to consider the, the Digilib, Digilib project at AUA, Armenian University, uh, American University of Armenia, which produces searchable digital documents. They have digitized thousands of ancient and more recent uh, pieces of literature. Yes, this is another uh, excellent project as well, and perhaps they could be uh, brought into this undertaking too. There's a lot to do. The, the material is there. We just need to find it and exploit it. So if there are no more questions, David, is that you? Are you wait, raising your hand or are you telling me enough already? No, no, that okay. is me. What do you think might still be out there that you or other scholars have not yet found, I mean, perhaps in the, the homes of people or in private collections? I mean, is there much, do you think there's still much more of this out there that we have not seen or have not even discovered yet? Yes. Uh, the question is what may still be out there? And uh, of course, that's the type of thing you can only speculate about, and I do. Um, I think people, I know people have things because sometimes we end up with them or end up hearing about them. Uh, collections of letters, they think these are not important. Maybe they aren't important, but maybe they are very interesting and maybe they are very uh, revelatory of the thoughts or the issues, the problems of members of the community at, at, at one time or another. Business records. Business records would be extremely valuable. I wish, I wish my uh, forerunners and, and their partners had saved the, the records of the Ararat Grocery Company uh, and, and its, and its uh, other component parts. It would be interesting to see in much more detail what the economy of that business was, how, how they carried out business, who they carried out business with. We really don't have that except a few scraps of paper here and there. Uh, there are certain publications that are exceedingly rare. Uh, for example, I, I showed 
at one point, Yeprad, which was published for a couple of years in, in Worcester. You can't find a complete set of those anywhere. Uh, we have a, a few copies here. Other libraries have a few copies, uh, but you cannot find a complete set. Not even in Worcester. Not even at the Worcester Historical Society or the Worcester Public Library, you would think might have it, but they don't. There are plenty of, plenty of materials out there waiting to be found, and, and uh, this would be an opportune time to say, if you think you have such interesting materials in your, in your closet or bottom drawer and would like to know more about them or find a home for them, please be in touch with us, because uh, Ani Babayan or, and I will be happy to come to your house and take a look at them and, and tell you what it, what it is and, and whether uh, probably is something that belongs preserved in an archive or an institution such as Nasser. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, if you go, uh, Aram, uh, Ani and I did a Library Treasures feature on this photo a couple of years ago, was it, Ani? Yeah, and, and we identified as many of the people at the head table as we could at that time, um, which is, you know, a reasonable number because the, the Armenian delegation people are, are identifiable. There are a few people from Harvard who could be identified. Um, I think James Barton from Near East Relief is in there somewhere. Some of the uh, clergy could be identified. But it's, it's amazing how uh, in the photograph itself, whoops, when you look at it, well, I, it sounds silly to say right now because it's so small, but uh, Antrenig, you immediately your eye just immediately goes to General Antronik. Let me then conclude by saying thank you again. And uh, again, thank you to those of you who are with us online. And uh, especially those of you who are watching, maybe online from some place that doesn't have an institution such as Nasser or other Armenian institutions that we have such a, such a wealth of around here. And uh, please support Nasser and these organizations that, and allow us to do our work. Uh, this is my final message. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, for those of you in the room, you, and maybe you, you came in late and didn't hear uh, what, what Silva said, there is a free, no charge, free copy of the Armenians of New England with your name on it, or could be with your name on it, at the back of the room, uh, please take one. And if you're online and watching and are jealous, buy one. Thank you. <laughs>